Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show. This is episode number 188 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling, people? As you can see by the video, I'm messing around with my sunglasses that I bought from H&M for five pounds because they're looking a bit really ratty. They probably make my head look smaller than what they what my head actually is. But don't worry, just the angle of the camera. My head is usually isn't that big. Anyway, hope you guys are well, rested, hydrated, lubricated, limbered up and all that malarkey. It is now Wednesday morning, Wednesday early in the morning. Um, to buck the usual trend, I haven't gone out running today. And if you're asking why I did it, well, you know, why didn't you go running at, Why didn't you go running this morning? The reason why, because I'm waiting for my uh, Bluetooth wireless headphones to come in. Because the headphones I have previously, the ones I always use, are basically dying a slow death. These headphones here, they've done they've done pretty well for me, actually. Um, you've probably seen reviews of them online. They're the top rated um, cheap head, cheap Bluetooth, wire, or cheap, they're the most highly rated uh, wireless headphones out there, especially for people that want to work out and stuff. They're by a brand called Empower Flame or something along those kinds. Is it Empower? Yes, yeah, so Empower, right? Um, they're about 20 quid on the UK um, um, Amazon, but you probably can get them cheaper on other websites if, you, if you're that way inclined. Here they are on the camera, as you can see there. Um, again, really good um, headphones. I've used them for a while. They've, got, they've done me really well. Um, I've got a lot of use out of them. But as you can see, over the years, or not over the years, over the last few months, they've kind of fucked up. I've kind of cracked them, maybe have them sitting in my pocket in the back seat. I mean, in the back pocket. Um, what else is it? The the sound has sort of died over a period of time. They were quite good. They were quite they were quite good sounding in the beginning, and then over time the sound quality has deteriorated over time. But that's that's to be expected with something that costs twenty pounds. And um, overall they're just a bit ritty. But the thing I like about the most running wise is that number one, there's no inline controls, right? So don't, you don't need to um, play and pause or put the volume up and down through a but for a little kind of. Um, mini remote thing on the cable a lot of a lot of kind of wireless headphones have that sort of thing there and for me personally i don't know about you guys but when i'm running or when i'm working out i i hate having a little flat thing smacking across my neck i just want everything to be kind of like compressed i know some running headphones have an inline remote and they also have like a sort of clip that you can put in at the end to kind of tighten it so it doesn't bang on you too much but again i don't i don't find that clip thing that comfortable so I'm happy that everything's kind of built in on the actual earpiece so you don't have to do anything that way. They're a bit bulky. That's the only thing about it. They're not the most uh, slender of designs. So they do they do protrude out a little bit. If I put them on now, if you're watching by the YouTube video, you can see that they do protrude out quite a bit, right? And my ears are fairly small, I'd say, for the most part. And they do kind of take up all the kind of, um, estate, um what do you call it, estates the space all over my ears as you can see i'm sure the, the there's a new beats by dre's ones coming out soon aren't they so they might be a little bit more slender i'm going to check those out and see how they look like but the main thing that i like about his headphones and i don't i didn't see in, in a lot of wireless headphones i saw out there was the fact that they've got these clips that go over the ears and again because i've got small ears um it's hard to get um earbuds that fit into my ears and stay in and so they my earphones tend to fall out a lot so having the extra security having this little loop that goes over the top of your ear is super handy because then when i'm wearing a headband across my head i can always kind of put the headband top lid thing just um one of the on the side just above or just over this bit here so it kind of keeps the headphone um slid, um slotted into my earlobes and usually because i'm you know because i'm running so fucking you know haphazard and banging all over the place i need something that's going to stay in my ear and not kind of move around so those are the headphones i've been using for the last i don't know six or so months and they've, they've done me pretty well actually um so much so that i've kind of slowly veered off the wide headphones um use i know for most audio files you would agree that you know you get better sound or much better sound um, you can you can see a, there's more discernible qualities you can tell from sound when you're wearing a wired headset, um, but nowadays with the advent of you know, um, with Apple kind of steering away from having headphone jacks on their appliances, with most people using Bluetooth um, headphones in order to kind of double up as hands-free kit if someone's calling you to take out your headphone and answer your phone again, you know, it just seems a bit clunky. It's things that we would have done. Imagine a few years ago, right? Um, if someone calls you on the phone and you've got to take out your headphones and answer the phone, it just that was just a standard thing you did, right? Nowadays, it's, it's like an inconvenience. You feel as if you've been inconvenienced having to take out your headphone or unplug your phone or pause it. Whereas now with the Bluetooth headset, for the most part, if someone's talking to the street and they want to ask you a question, you can just you know press a button on the side of it. Or with some with some headsets, you just got a gesture you can use and you can automatically pause the music. So I'm currently waiting for the new edition, for the newest version of these, actually, because again, I didn't want to spend too much money with these because I'm, I'm running the... 
I'm going to hopefully run the Hackney Half Marathon in a couple of weeks. So I didn't necessarily want to go and buy £200 worth of headphones. I want to save most of that money for uh, some pair of running shoes I need to get in order to kind of make sure that I run that race well. So I'm doing the Hackney Half Marathon in the, end of the, end of the, well, in the middle of the month, on the 19th of May. I just need a new pair of running headphones that I could wear that wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't, that I'm fucked up, that have good quality sound that I could use for the running. So I'm waiting for that to come in. Once that comes in today, I'm going to go for a nice little five minute, five mile easy run at lunch when I, once I finish my work. So that's basically why I'm here now, not looking sweaty or whatever. But I have been doing a lot of push ups. I've been doing, I've been trying to do 100 push ups, 100 sets every day. I've kind of carried that on from last week. I had a break in the, in the, in the weekend, so I've kind of done that yesterday. I'm going to do it again today. I did about 50 push ups today, so I've got a lot more reps to do. But that's just, just, just in general, just kind of have a good core. I, fi- I found that when I run a lot, I tend not to go to the gym. You know, I tend to kind of taper up the gym workouts because it takes out a lot. It takes a lot out of you running in the morning going to the gym in the evening or doing it the other way around so sometimes i tend to kind of like lay things i tend to kind of sometimes concentrate on one thing and leave the other thing for another time and plus because it's such a short period of time it's coming up in about three weeks i don't really have the time to kind of really get down and dirty with my uh strengthening uh power my what do my, my strength workout sorry so i'm going to concentrate primarily on the endurance and hopefully fingers crossed it goes as need to be Anyway, um, let's go crack on with the show. What do I want to talk about today? <clears throat> Number one topic to talk to you about today is that yesterday for our little uh, birthday dinner, you know, mine and the brunette's um, birthday joined up together. Well, it's always this month anyway. So we we um, we decided to go to the Hawksmoor and have a nice little steak dinner for ourselves to kind of celebrate, uh, you know. Um, celebrate your birthday vibes as i mentioned before i'm not really the biggest birthday celebration person i tend to veer more towards the side of like you know the older you get the less you should be making a show of it i think it's a bit embarrassing when you just you know making such a big deal out of your birthday um uh what you call it guilt tripping people into coming to your shindigs um pestering people with facebook invites with text messages i just find it a little bit a little bit distasteful i'm not really the biggest fan of it i think it's just maybe keep your counsel don't be a dickhead let people um let people decide if they want to acknowledge your birthday or not and then go from there but as, as it's your own birthday you're more within your you're more you're more within your you're well within your rights to kind of you know decide to kind of buy a big bottle of whiskey some champagne and whatever and give yourself a toast now don't toast yourself online right don't post a picture of yourself drinking on your own on your birthday online because that looks incredibly sad right if you're just seeking for sympathy then fair enough that works because everyone's going to be sad for you but don't do that Buy yourself a whiskey, buy yourself some champagne, toast yourself and keep it moving. That's what I kind of agree with. But anyway, that being said, my personal beliefs out of the way, we decided to go to the Hawksmoor and have a dinner. Um, it's been a while since I've been there. I first I first was uh, blessed to have dinner at Hawksmoor uh, due to a workplace I used to work at um, in the early part of my streetwear days that took me there um, for like a team bonding thing. Again, at the time, I think Hawksmoor had just launched. I think Spitfield might have been their first site. And I wasn't very familiar with Spitfields. I mean, I wasn't really familiar with Hawksmoor and what they were doing. We go in there. It's an amazing, glitzy place. Very well done. There's a front of house. Something, again, I'm not very used to. And then we proceed to get, you know, we proceed to basically get all... We didn't really get a chance to order what we wanted. They, basically, the person we were with was a lot more educated and a lot more cultured than we were. So they basically ordered a bit of everything from the menu. And when it came on a on a table, you know, it couldn't have gone quicker, right? We were just like scoffing that shit up hard, from the mac and cheese to the steak to the triple cut to the triple fried chips. It just all went in. It, it went in fucking milliseconds. I just remember leaving that place thinking, oh, now I get why people make such a big deal about going to like you know really high quality steakhouses because I don't know. Sometimes I think I've mentioned previously, I'm not much of a foodie. I do enjoy eating good food but i wouldn't say i wouldn't say i'm a foodie i wouldn't say that i go out my way to learn or understand about different sort of coloring techniques or i'm I'm going out and seeking out the best place to get certain items i might go to the odd place here or there that's been spoken about in, in different circles or i might read a review of certain restaurant i'll go just to go check what it's like right um essential um because a lot of people you know there's loads of good food review sites out there like cheese and biscuits that i follow you should check out um I do do that sometimes, but I'm not very necessarily on the front line of the most, you know, what's happening in the culinary scene in London. So 
when when it happens, I tend not to I tend not to put things on pedestals. I'm not that you know. I'm like, oh, all steak restaurants are the same, right? You don't really. It's that kind of naive uh, Neanderthal thinking on man. But then once you go to like a really good steakhouse, especially in the UK, which is hard to come by because you know for the most part, you know, good quality meats here, especially priced well. Um, you know, in a decent location that isn't a, some sort of fuddy daddy place, it's hard to come by in my experience. So going to a place like the Hawks Mall where it's super relaxed, a uh, really laid back atmosphere, they don't take themselves too seriously. They just make good quality food. It's really, it's a, it's, it's a really, um, it's what you call it, um, it's a real pleasure, right? You start to think, wow, this is amazing, man. I can't believe this is right around the corner from where I live, like in you know, a half an hour. I got like a, a rail line to Liverpool Street and walked up there like basically half an hour door to door. It's like it's such a it's such a blessing to have something right near your house that's of that kind of quality. And yeah, so we we went we went there. We had a nice little sup up dinner. I have pictures on my phone, but I don't know how to get them up. So I'm just going to show you what people have on Google Images. And I'm going to show you what I ate. So went to the Spitalfields place. Um, the Spitalfields talks more. Really good place. We ordered a T-bone steak. Uh, seven eight hundred grams. It ran out of the seven hundred fifty. We got one portion of triple of triple fried steak chips, which they got here on the, on the screen. We also got a mac and cheese each, which went in seconds. That mac and cheese is so good, like insane. I think um we I think we realized when we were eating it that it might have some blue cheese in it. That's what probably makes a difference. That was really nice. And then you know what? As well, there was a winner that I didn't that I didn't um that I'm sure I'm sure other people have mentioned, or I'm not sure if other people mentioned as well, was the ketchup. The house ketchup they have in the in, the, in in oh my god, I don't know if it's I don't know what they make it I don't know what they make how they make it or what's inside of it but it's incredibly tasty man. It's just the no ketchup they have in you know they they make um in house really really good. I really recommend you check it out. But yeah, this is the Hawks Mall. We didn't have any dessert actually because I was I was incredibly full. It was just surprising. I thought I would have had room for a little dessert, but I didn't. So we kind of skipped that. There's a burger and chips, which I've had before too. That was really nice. I have, I think I had a little quarter of somebody's burger and chips and eating it. I think it's quite nice going to a place like this together as a group of friends. Or, yeah, I think it's a group of friends just ordering a bit of the little bits of the menu, like pieces, bit, bits and pieces, and just splitting the, the difference at the end. It works out really well. A meal for two, again, for me and my partner, we ended up paying about £110, I think, all in. I had a glass of wine, she had a Coke. So that kind of worked out as it is. But I think if you want to go to the big group of friends, I think splitting it amongst three or more people would work out really well. Everyone eat really good food. You drink some good drinks and it's a nice um, casual ambiance overall. Um, yeah, so this is the menu. This is again showing you the inside of it. They've got a bar downstairs too. They just, they just, I don't think they just open, but it's uh, been there for a while. I'm pretty sure I've been there before. The basement, door, a basement bar that's just next door to the actual place itself, and it was quite, it was quite packed on a Tuesday, a random Tuesday evening. So I'm assuming a lot of people go there for number one for meetings because there's a lot of freelancers there. Imagine being a freelancer and being able to kind of, you know, be able to expense a dinner at Hawksmoor with a client, quote unquote. Fucking cheeky cunts, man. I'd love that. <laughs> Over here, it was super packed with uh, uh, business people, freelancers and stuff, people that look like they were from the area just having dinner or locals that come there quite often. That was cool. Oh, look at that burger with the sausage in it. What the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, it was just full of good food, man. Yeah, so that's a T-bone steak that we got, similar to this um, T-bone steak, and it's already cut up for you inside the little um, cast iron skillet extremely hot so be careful again it's the meat is so good as most meat is meant to be we got a bit we got a bit worried because when we ordered the waiter told us towards the end oh do you want a sauce and i was thinking in the back of my head oh man if they ask if they if they're telling us we want sauce i didn't know whether or not it was a an add-on sale or if it was one of those things like you know you have to have the sauce because this meat isn't that good without the sauce and you know it was like nah let's take our chances like no that's okay let's leave the sauce for now and we left the sauce, but I was thinking, fuck, maybe it's one of those sauces that really complements the meat really well. And if you don't have any meat, it's tasty. But I know from my limited experience that the good, a good marker of a good steak or a good steakhouse is that you can eat the steak itself uh, without any kind of condiment. You don't need any sauce, any accessory, nothing on it to kind of make it, to kind of make the meat come alive or to make the meat tasty. And when a skillet came, I have to admit, that shit was good. Um, the only difference I'd probably make is I'd probably order it. This I don't know what um what level of rare this is on the picture here, but I'd order it here like this because we ordered it medium rare and it was good. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't as buttery as I wanted to. I wanted it just to kind of literally melt in my mouth. I don't know if that's because of the T-bone steak is that particular meat is a little bit more harder than the other bits of meat, so other parts of the body. But I think next time I would probably I I probably I'm not sure what the level of rares are. We ordered medium rare, right? I'm not sure what the levels are, but I'll check it in a minute. But whatever this level is here, the slightly more pink, 
um, I'd probably order it that way. Um, yeah, really good stuff. The triple cut chicks is there. The cocktails look awesome. People are having, but I didn't order one. The dessert looks really good. And just in general, just an absolutely bang up place. I think next time I'd go, I'd probably do the free course meal thing and just do that way. That might be a good option. Or just do their meal of the day, whatever way. Uh, they've got Sunday roast too that they do. I'm not really the biggest fan of Sunday roast. Are you guys not the biggest Sunday roast guy? I know a lot of my friends tend to go to Sunday roast and have all that enjoyment. Maybe it's the idea of like gathering around the table with your friends is more important actually than the actual food itself. But no, uh, no, that doesn't do it for me. But yeah, dessert looks really nice. Everything looks amazing. Great little place. I'm sure most people are aware of the Hawksmoor and what they do. Or the Hawksmoor or Hawksmoor. I don't know how you say it. If it's the or her. No, it's just Hawksmoor, yeah. So yeah, um, definitely recommend you check it out. Again, they've done amazingly well because they've been able to rec they've been able to replicate the same level of standards in all the other restaurants they've been to. I think all restaurants I've checked out, especially when I was checking online when I was deciding where I was going to put my book on a reservation. The reviews were all stellar, all four stars and up. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and it's quite hard to do again. I think that's why I give so much credit to people like Meat Liquor and places like Hawksmoor and places like even like Pilgrims, or whatever. Um, the more the more places you open, sometimes the quality starts to dip. I know that's true for chicken sours. You know, it wasn't necessarily... It, it's the bigger it started to get, the worse the chicken started to get. And I think some restaurants have to... You know, just have, it's just the nature of the beast, really, isn't it? You can't necessarily ensure the standards are the same across the board. And sometimes the bigger you get, you might have to skimp and save on some of the produce that you're making, that you're using, blah, 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 blah. It happens as part of the process. But I'm really happy and glad that these guys have been able to kind of keep this level of standard going forward. But yeah, I recommend you check it out. Hawksmoor, it's in Spitalfields. They've got a few others dotted around London. Check it out. They're online. It's really easy to book a table there. Um, via the open table no I think they've got it it's, it's all built in via the website just go on the website and you can book a table but it's, they use they use open table as a service they, the open table is really good too because it reminds you um, on the day as well if you want to um, what was I going to say it reminds you too before a couple of days before if you're about your booking it reminds you if you're going to if you're going to cancel to cancel it now sort of thing to give them a heads up um, and I would recommend you do that too restaurant industry um, suffers enough as it is without having people booking in advance and not calling up when they need to cancel um, so yeah definitely check that out Hawksmoor and Spitalfield one of my favourite um, restaurants hands down in London let alone steak restaurants but yeah great 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 place um, next on the list here what else do we have I need to talk about ba, 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 ba. let's get straight into it right yeah cool so number one I thought that was really cool. I saw this little video of Virgil DJing at Circo Loco and he's as I've written here that he's stepping up the levels of production or just the level of a kind of showmanship. And again, it's something that I will reserve judgment on. It's something that I'm speaking about myself. I'm sure other people might disagree. But looking at what looking at what Virgil's doing in his DJ in life and looking how fast that's progressing, it's kind of marrying up it's kind of marrying up slightly with the levels that he's reaching in terms of fashion and design his kind of influence is kind of far reaching so much so that there's a story so recently a hype piece about off-white suing a particular company for essentially you know copying or re uh, you know basically copying a bracelet they, they did but uh, putting other words in the quotation marks and the kind of you know the dicey ground that they're on there but it's it's it, you, sort of, you can't not admit that you know he has his influence on of surpassed um streetwear or fashion right he's kind of um, permeated um the the general zeitgeist or the zeitgeist in general the general consciousness uh the awareness people have of design is kind of you know it's kind of largely being steered by the stuff that he's doing or he's kind of participating in that overall wave that's going on and the levels are kind of i you know they're stepping up bit by bit and i've kind of mentioned previously as well that i've been a bit um i've been a bit annoyed a little bit let down a little bit disappointed with the levels of production when it comes to dj shows lately um the only thing that really caught me aghast that really got me like thinking wow it left me kind of awe inspired it left me really motivated to go back home and start mixing was the show that i went to recently where i saw Nina Kravitz play at the Crank Brothers presents uh, Retextured at their little um, you know um, multi venue festival they did they did a few weeks ago, and I went to the Woman's so Assembly Hall and you know Crank Brothers put on an amazing production. Um, they really utilized you know they really kind of um, utilized Nina Kravitz in the right way. You know if you're familiar with Nina Kravitz, she's an extremely popular techno DJ hailing from Russia, but she has this way of contorting her body behind the decks and moving around and you know really being in the moment and kind of letting the music take on take over her kind of this kind of spiritual exorcism happens behind the decks and they did they, re they really made they really made it come to life by having a massive projection screen behind her uh led screen i think for the most part uh, displaying different images different words it would 
black out a bit. There weren't any lights directly overhead on Nina Kravitz. So she was essentially a, a dark silhouette behind the DJ booth. It was a massive black box, kind of like a, not, a, not a sheet, just a massive black box completely covered, nothing else shining, just the lights from the CDJs and the screen from the back behind her. So at moments so all you could see was a silhouette and the lighting was kind of matching up with it. So just incredible production. Incredible production really made me think, wow, this is awesome. No one behind her too. No groupie standing behind trying to, you know, get involved and try and act like they're part of the show. All the groupies had to sit, stand by the side of the show. All her friends had to stand by the side of the show too. So a really good level of production. But I think for the most part, places I've been to have been quite a let down, right? It's been just been a guy sit standing on a table playing music. There's no real, there's no real um, attention to detail when, into the actual production of the actual event itself. No real interior design. No, nothing, nothing, right? Just, you know, good sound system and DJ, which is probably what you need which is probably the bare minimum you need, right? But I think as um, the popularity of electronic music gets bigger and bigger and you have be you have uh, more and more fans coming in, more new people coming in, um, the budgets get bigger, the venues get bigger, promoters want to take more chances. I think they should take more chances with their bookings and with the productions that they put on. You need to go a little bit further. And more importantly, the DJs too need to bring it. You need to kind of come in there and fucking go, go for it full tilt. And I've been following a lot of these big DJs online I'm always kind of crate digging with their local, with their recent performances. I do the same thing most kind of, you know, aspiring DJs do where you follow a few DJs, um, you find out where they're playing on Resident Advisor, you maybe go on YouTube and find if you can find clips of them playing, see if somebody uh, uploaded a tune ID that you can maybe uh, add onto your crate. You might go into Instagram and find out where they're playing location-wise and see any videos people uploaded there. Same sort of process we all do, yeah? Go on Discogs, go on Beatport, dig, 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 dig. But I think a lot of DJs, for the most part, were kind of, you know, taking their foot off the gas and not being, you know, not bringing it, not bringing it again. I think with someone like Virgil coming in from the outside in, you know, he comes from the fashion streetwear back. And even though he's been DJing for a long time, I think his perspective has, is going to greatly affect and be uh, a more net, I think it's going to be a net positive for DJs and the electronic scene going on all over, right? Um, all around, sorry, uh, for the future coming. Um, number one, the Coachella set looked amazing, right? He did that massive screen in the collaboration with Futura, um, the Time Flies thing, where supposedly he's going to take that on tour, which will be quite cool as well to see him kind of basically touring the world as a DJ act, maybe having other supporting DJs play with him, maybe having... Um, certain artists come out on stage and play with him too that would be awesome as well um so i think that level of production having a massive screen collaborating with an artist then projecting images on the screen something that we might see kind of iterated down with other artists too other djs the other thing i thought would be quite interesting is the idea of the table and how he laid out the actual dj deck table itself it was very bare very minimal just a massive black table long legs with nothing else on the on the on the table no other distractions no other gizmo just a big table and him playing on the decks kind of similar to that legendary uh jeff mills video where he's kind of you know showing you how he mixes and puts tunes together the wizard i think i forgot what the video is called but i'm watching it ages ago where it's called so i've got a camera zooming down a camera in front and it's essentially just him sitting on top of a black of a black table and just fucking you know smashing it to pieces uh the next thing as well is the fact that he had a bespoke or like a limited edition uh made to order a custom pair of uh cdjs and a dj am mixer made for him and they're made completely see-through i think i've shown you a picture of them previously um he's got a completely see-through deck and a completely see-through mixer um, by pioneer that just sits there and the lights you know they're glowing the the jog wheels are made um the but the knobs are different color too i think they're like orange but the actual body of the thing is just completely clear translucent so you can see the actual inside of a cj which we never get to see so that's quite cool so i think we're going to see that get iterated more um the use of gloves he's using his um louis vuitton uh construction worker kind of gloves when he's djing on um when he's when, he, when he's at djing so then of course when when photographers come for up taking the you know the famous pictures of djs you know fucking around in the mix or whatever usually um the kind of you know the the set the kind of the selling point that way was the concentration on dj's face or the maybe the finger tattoos or maybe the great frog silver rings but nowadays imagine kind of it going forward and it being an idea of like you know adorning your hands with some kind of gloves maybe a promotion maybe a collaboration that you've done that would be quite a cool way to do it maybe you know maybe the maybe they're not gonna be the most comfortable thing to wear in a nightclub in a sweaty nightclub but that might be a good way to go about things and then i think the other thing i wanted to mention was the merch right he's kind of really gone he's he's kind of really, Virgil's really gone the extra step with his merch in terms of his djing stuff not only is he having not only is he wearing custom made t-shirts that he makes himself um he's also making uh workwear jackets right in terms of like you know the idea is like you know 
the DJ that that he's DJing, but it's also work, right? He's going, he's turning up for work. This is kind of the you know the DJ construction crew. They're, they're designing sounds. They're providing a soundscape. So he's got this amazing kind of short jacket that he wore, a work jacket. I don't know what you'd call that jacket that he wore at Coachella. That was really cool. And he's got the same thing that he wore here at Soko Loco. So I think these little tidbits, these little um, bits of pe bits and pieces that he's adding into his DJ Arsenal, apart from the music that is already good and it's already getting to a good level. I think just being surrounded by that level of people, of DJs, you're obviously going to absorb a lot from them. You're going to learn a lot. And your levels are going to step up. But I think those other things added on, you're going to see get iterated with other DJs because for the most part, these people that really take a real concentrate aim on their production and what they do on the actual show is maybe the top 10 you know the david get no this david getter the sven vars all those kind of people the ones that are getting paid the, the big big bucks they go above and beyond with their production because i guess you know for the most part they kind of have to the, the the audience that comes to those kind of shows pays a lot of money for the tickets they get a lot of money they usually play in spaces that allow them freedom to kind of maybe you know go a bit crazy with the sound system maybe go a bit crazy with the with the drinks menu maybe go a bit crazy with the sound design maybe go a bit crazy with the lighting but i guess the lower the dj and the less money they're getting the less likely they're able or willing to kind of invest money into kind of getting the show where it should be level wise but i think overall in the long run term we're going to see a, a bit of a culture shift in terms of how these shows are put on anyway enough talking about me um look at the pictures so this is some pictures of Virgil uploaded from him at Soko Loco in Milan it looks fucking awesome so here he's, he's wearing a jacket or a t-shirt or a t-shirt that's uh, with 3M on the back with a 3M print that says Amnesia Scanner which is super cool you see him the Seth, um, Virgil, Virgil next next to Seth Troxler again another DJ who was very big on a showmanship somebody that kind of essentially essentially he's um his DJing career was uh, boosted or kind of, you know, hit the heady heights based on some of the quirky and kind of, you know, no holes barred interview that he gave over the years. He's kind of reined in a little bit more. He doesn't necessarily talk as much as he did previously, maybe because, you know, he's a lot more mature now. He's probably said all he needs to say. He's a different space. Uh, but he's also another DJ too that I think would probably benefit a lot from having that uh, virtual energy next to him because he's, I'm sure some of the stuff shops has got loads of ideas of how he could uh, boost his show. I could get it um looking better produced better and i'm sure with the life project he's doing now is it the lost child of whatever it's called saturn i think or whatever he's doing at the moment now um that's something that you could easily kind of you know um uh roll into that um you've got another image here coming up oh yeah and this is the zoom image of dj of virgil djing on those clear see-through decks like you can't tell me that's not cool, man. How cool does that fucking look? I can't wait until these come out. I don't know when they're going to come out, if they ever do come out, but they look fucking incredible. Again, it might be a limited edition thing, like similar to the... Because I, I don't know how many people actually bought the all-white CDJs. I didn't like them personally. I'm not sure if you guys like them yourself. I didn't really like the all-white CDJs. I thought they looked a bit shit. I think these look fucking awesome and such a cool way to promote... Um, an item with uh, Pioneer, which I'm sure you, you collaborated... Derek could be a pioneer because it ties in essentially to the stuff that he's doing already with um what's the suitcase company did it with anyway yeah you know what i'm talking about it ties in completely with doing the suitcase mm -hmm. company it's got the same sort of design codes as the nike collaboration that he done earlier you know kind of unearthing or you know exposing the inner details uh tweaking the design by three percent and then kind of you know getting what you're getting now on screen and i think these will sell out i honestly do think these will sell out because again i wasn't a fan of the whites i don't think any dj for the most part what worth their skin really wants a pair of white decks really it's not really the best thing it probably not isn't the most um, aesthetically pleasing especially for the most part most dj equipment is black or of a silver kind of base to it maybe gray if there's any kind of color in it so getting all white decks is not the best best thing but i think see-through i think a whole line of this i think if virgil was if if if, if he was if he was able to and pioneer or willing to i think where they could actually kill it with this collaboration is if they did an entire kit Right, you know how he's doing with IKEA. He's kind of promoting this idea that he wants kids to be able to afford, you know, really well designed and well considered um, interior design furniture pieces, right, for a fraction of the price. So somebody like a Virgil being able to collaborate with IKEA, it basically democratizes, um, you know, uh, furniture for the regular kid out there. I'm sure the resale price would be crazy, but for the most part, you can get a piece of Virgil for I don't know, maybe for thirty pound upwards. What would be really cool is that if they could somehow um get together with pioneer and design a whole entire kit from maybe the bottom or maybe the middle all the way up into the top so essentially you could design um a dj controller i'm not sure what dj controller it would be but one of the dj controllers in the pioneer lineup and get that to be completely see-through and then maybe um 
the ones above, just above that, maybe the, the RX2 could be see-through too. Maybe some speakers that they make could be see-through. Maybe some headphones that they make could be see-through. Like an entire kit, some studio monitors. That would look insane. I think that would look amazing in the studio, like having that just look at you. And I think, you know what it actually reminds me of? It reminds me of that old school iMac. Do you remember the iMac from 2010? No, 2010. I think it was 2001. The iMac with the with the massive translucent uh, um, shell at the back of it, different colors like blue, purple, green. I think that kind of got the code to that in it. But yeah, that looks fucking amazing. So again, um, I think we're gonna see a little bit more of Advent. And don't be surprised if you see a lot more DJs going to merch. Like again, Virgil's wearing an orange long sleeve T-shirt he designed himself with amnesia scan at the back. I think that's again another kind of another showcase of just how different um, his approach is in terms of all black Rick Owens, you know, Julius kind of look. You're gonna maybe see a bit of a shift coming towards it. And even even if they still do the off the kind of rick owens um all black look at least do a collaboration with them that'll make it a little more interesting but again regardless i think it's really cool to see um again um the televised radio uh chore jacket that uh, virgil wore during his coachella set and again the mg is kind of shirt there so again we're seeing a lot a, a different a different side to virgil playing these dj sets with these kind of people again maybe it's a he's pivoting in on purpose um towards this kind of scene and really getting into the electronic techno house scene and really kind of you know positioning himself as a really um well-known and established dj there but i think as a promoter as well you can't complain if you're a deep couple dj oh he's taking people's slots i think as a promoter it's a no-brainer you get virgil who's kind of you know a name that's going to sell itself plus everyone else on the list so imagine you you got virgil you got martinez brothers you've got seth truxler you've got Matthew Plex, all these big names playing plus you've got a virgil Avalo playing it's, it's no-brainer that uh, a, a promoter would want to get him on the on the books and of course i think like most things like um comedy you get given you get given a bit of a bligh right you get maybe given the benefit of the doubt if you're not good you can get to play but i think you know after the second third time if you're not good people will know and they'll just stop booking you because it probably does their brand more more damage than good so i think the fact that he's getting booked so often maybe shows that you know um at the moment he's at a level that really does warrant getting books at these kind of venues um there's a couple of videos here too as well that show some of the stuff that he was doing maybe quickly check that but honestly i think it's cool man i think it's cool to see we're actually seeing a different side maybe it's gonna again I'm, I'm i'm happy to see more scene dj's maybe take this kind of route going forward again those oh, those clear through see through decks look so fucking impressive don't they look so good so so good they'll be worth big bucks though of course but i can't wait to see um them out and available for everyone to purchase remix there little sign but yeah anyway let's let's x off this he's doing his thing i'm doing my thing let's move on that's it for that um what else we need to go on um uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. uber founder backs dark kitchens um investment yeah i think i talked about this before. did i speak about this before oh man now it's making me pay isn't it no i don't want to pay fuck i hate i hate a bit of a paywall on this little thing here didn't i unfortunately let's see if i can get this open copy link let's see if i can get this open in incognito sometimes if you use incognito it works really well you don't need to pay anything but let's see if it happens nah damn it okay we'll have to move on do that another time uh what's up 50th anniversary cancelled this is interesting hold on let's see if i can find a travis kalkan travis uh kalkanic Kale kalinic uh dark kitchen right ba 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 Right, article from the Telegraph. I'll show you guys this one quickly, and then we'll move on. Oh, you have to pay everywhere, don't you? Fucking hell, news. Okay, there's a Daily Mail article here. We'll just use that one, right? Dark Kitchens, and then we'll do another one from the BBC quickly here. Let's get this up there. Another article from the BBC. That thought was good. Where was it? Is it there? There you go. Boom. So um, I think I spoke about this before. Did I speak about this before with you guys? I'm not sure if I did. But anyway, this is an interesting article. So um, essentially, Travis Kalkanik, um, the ex, um, the ex, well, the guy that was formerly involved with Uber, was probably, he was actually the original founder of Uber, but unfortunately got asked out of the company due to um, other extenuating circumstances. Um, but he's now kind of um, bounced back and decided to invest in the Dark Kitchens uh, venture. And if you're not familiar with Dark Kitchens, essentially what a Dark Kitchen is, 
is that there are these um, portable, sometimes remote kitchens in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in London, that essentially allow um, up and coming restaurateurs, uh, people that want to <laughs> you know, get involved in the food industry, to set up a kitchen and be able to uh, sell directly to people on apps such as Deliveroo and Uber Eats. Sometimes when you order from Uber Eats and Deliveroo, those kind of apps, you're usually ordering from a shop or a restaurant itself, right? You're directly in a shop that around the corner. You want to order. You don't kind of have to move. You want to deliver it to your front door. Sometimes the things that you're ordering from on the app, you're probably not aware of it, aren't actually real restaurants. They're not real restaurants. They're not physical restaurants, sorry. They're essentially restaurants that are based in kitchens that only operate between Monday and Friday, for instance, or a particular set time of day, right? And they have a particular menu that's only specifically sold online or sold via the app. Same way with some restaurants they only have a certain particular they only have a portion of the rest of the menu available on the uber eats app because some food doesn't travel well because some items are more popular than others but etc etc et so nowadays especially with the raising with the rising cost in rent and you know with just you know the lack of real estate um that surrounding london and the fact that you know investing in a restaurant is a lot of money and it takes a lot of capital and not certainly sure it's going to work a good way to experiment and to kind of figure out if your if your venture is going to work and there's demand for it is to get a food truck and you know there's loads of food um festivals or markets happening around london or around most metropolitan cities as you guys are aware of or the next best thing is to have your restaurant or foods listed on apps such as deliver and uber eats and these dark kitchens are now kind of popping up all over the place around london i think the main kind of proponent of it is a company called food stars they have a couple of restaurants a couple of kitchens around this area they have uh, where i live in east london they have some based around Vauxhall, i think in south london near the canals there where the arches are there and essentially um uber east of delivery drivers kind of sit outside those restaurants uh at the times that they're going to open when they're kind of you know when they know the rush of food orders are going to come and then from then on the the riders, the riders and whatever delivery people take the packages from there and deliver it all around the uh, surrounding area. So it's a really cool, interesting venture. Um, again, just to really, uh, just, just again to highlight, you know, if you're somebody, if you're, if you're Travis Kalkanik and you founded Uber and you suddenly got ousted from your company, it's no coincidence that somebody of that kind of mentality, that kind of level of intellect is able to kind of bounce back in this sort of epic fashion. Because we're gonna, I think we're going to see a lot more of these happening, popping up all over the place. It's something that I would definitely consider doing myself as a business to start off something if I definitely had an idea to maybe set up a kitchen somewhere to set up a restaurant I'll definitely go this way I think it's the best way to go about things and probably less risk and you get direct you get quick you get um, um, you fail fast right um, kind of feedback you get to know exactly what working what people like what they don't like so it's this article on daily mail that kind of talks a little bit about it more um, I had an article on the FT that I went to read to you but um, unfortunately I've gone over my uh, free article a lot uh, allocation so I have to pay which I'm not going to do so this article here on daily mail it says uh, uber founder buys more than 100 dark kitchens across London in an adventure that allows takeaway only businesses to rent them from two thousand five hundred dollars uh, two thousand five hundred pounds a month to sell food on apps they brew they got the longest titles in the world, haven't they? Anyway, the the founder of Uber has invested in more than 100 dark kitchens used by takeaways. Travis Kalkanek pumped cash into units across London that allow businesses to rent spaces for 250 500 pound a month. I, I knew this was true because this makes sense because I, I do remember randomly when I think Travis got kicked out of Uber. I did. I, I'm pretty sure I saw him in a cafe somewhere in Holborn when I was walking down the street. I, listened, I was listening to an actual interview around the whole foray that happened when he was kind of asked for his company. I remember just thinking about, oh, like, I wonder what his next idea is going to be. I walked past a cafe and I'm pretty sure I saw him sitting on the window seat, just like, you know, on his phone chilling. I'm pretty sure it was him. Um, anyway, so it might make sense that he probably relocated here to London and has been kind of conducting business here for um, for the most part and then kind of, you know, keeping a low profile. I don't think he's actually spoken about what happened at Uber publicly. Anyway, the sites cater to, uh, cater to firms that did, don't want to offer in-house dining, but instead uh, sell meals through apps such as Deliveroo, which a lot of people are using all the time now i know for me personally i've used delivery apps you know or uber Eats apps to order just a mcflurry itself and if you know how much it costs delivery just order one mcflurry is fucking baller as fuck but you know i'm rich bitch anyway it continues mr kirkhanic city storage system css bought the food stars cut startup last year the financial times revealed regulatory filings show that the takeover included cloud kitchens which operates under css u.s best operation more than 600 u.s the u.s brand operates more than 100 kitchens in london in the company's first move outside the states mr kirkhanic spent 
150 million on controlling stake of CSS one year ago. Wow, that's some ballless money, mate. Uh, he is hoping to build on the food delivery market with a network of kitchens that can solely can cater solely for takeaway orders, such as Uber Eats, DoorDash, Hungry House, saw in popularity. Food Star started life in Bethnal Green in 2015 and was founded by William Burstwood, Daniel Absham, and Roy Shaby. The trio started working together in 2012, making takeaway sushi in Camberwell, South East London, and rented out their spare kitchen space. Um, great idea. By 2018, the firm had more than 100 kitchens at sites, including Kentish Town, Shoreditch, Vauxhall, and Battersea. It does not operate the kitchen, but leases it out, so it leases out real estate to takeaway companies in the capital. Food Stars describes the space as dark kitchens on its websites, which are rented out, fully stocked with cooking and prep equipment already in there. So it's amazing, right? Uh, Mr. Kirkanic's latest investment was revealed by Company House Records, which listed him as a person with significant control. Staff at Cow Kitchens have been instructed to keep their employer off their LinkedIn profile, a source told. Is it okay? Fair enough. But the company's house filings show that the directors are Mr. Burford and Mr. Shaby. Mr. Carhenry understood to have been to keep his venture off the radar of rivals, companies, house listings of offices. Da, da, da. Yeah, awesome. Um, let me show you a video actually that kind of talks about it a little more. I think I might have said, I think I might have spoken about this before, but again, it's a cool idea, so I don't mind speaking about it again. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this early in another podcast, but you know, sometimes you talk about so many things, man. You have so many ideas. You begin what you say, man. Uh, let's get this video up here. I think it's on the BBC. It talks a little bit about it more. The old dark kitchen trend. Show this. Boom. Dark kitchens. <laughs> the writer's picking up a takeaway food order, but not from a restaurant. So you've got the communal space, this is all shared, then the kitchen, so Boo, they do an amazing burger, they've got Chinese as you walk a little further down. There are um, individual sort of pods for each kitchen, right? Yeah, no, exactly, so individual kitchens, but then some of this space in the middle is shared. All the washing up is done by you guys. Absolutely. That's amazing, right? What a clever idea. So essentially, those three dudes that set up food stars or these rented kitchens, they actually just lease the kitchens out to deliver, which is another weird, amazing, um, in, what you call it, amazing uh, revenue stream. So they have these places, they rent them out to delivery, they pay rent, and then delivery charge the kitchens the rent that they're going to pay for the restaurants. I'm assuming that way, right? So they get so much money coming in that way. Um, again, so clever. It's just a clever business idea for the for the founders. It's clever because they, you know. Great way to make revenue by getting these um once unused spaces all around London, fitting up with the kitchen. For the most part, no one's going to object to it. It's not like opening up a nightclub. You know, people always have complaints about that sort of thing. It's a kitchen. As long as it's up to spec or up to regulatory conditions, for the most part, people are going to be okay with it. Um, It's a regular source of income. Um, Landlords may be more inclined to kind of give you that space because they know it's not really going to, you know, there's no way that you're going to suddenly go bust overnight. Um, There's guaranteed income. There's a run there's a kind of a, a, a specked out runway there and obviously more importantly for the prospective restaurant owner it's a good way to kind of again test out your idea see if it has any sort of legs and even even if you don't have aspiration to open up a restaurant there's a lot to be said for just having a, a, a dark kitchen a restaurant or a kitchen set up just for the app alone and that's it you don't have to deal with any customers face to face you just do everything via the app you send it you send your food out you get your good reviews and you just keep it moving i think it's a clever clever idea this is for all of the six restaurants this makes it cheaper, obviously. You're just running one. Yeah, well, yeah. One massive shriv. Sh- fridge tray for all the restaurants. I probably have their own little shelves or sections. Clever idea. Deliver the people one for free. It's a very cheap option. Yes, yes, because there, there's no rent. You don't have the resources to so i guess if you're delivery and you have a you have these dark kitchens you rent them out you rent them from food stars um obviously food stars probably take a portion of that for the profits and then pay the actual lease itself and then delivery then charges then gives the rest of the kitchen for free to restaurateurs maybe for a set period of time maybe so they can test their app and make sure it's working and take a portion of the sales so maybe it's free but then they take 60 percent of the or 40 percent, and then once they start paying a little bit of the subsidies to subsidize the rent and the upkeep then it may be it might you know the the percentages go up a little bit and maybe they get to keep so six seventy and the delivery takes 30. it's a fucking clever 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 idea and it just goes to show going forward what we're going to see is a lot more of these popping up all over the place and probably we're going to see less of the idea because i always thought in my head uh it, will, it would make sense that delivery would probably go go into opening up brick and mortar stores right or a little kind of gallery or a little kind of you know 
uh, a mall where there's loads of different stores that sell different sort of foods that are all controlled by delivery. But I think that'll probably be more has than what's worth. They're probably better off just have running these kitchens in the kind of hot spots. They, they they probably got all the data they need of the places that have the most frequency of orders and then opening up dark kitchens in those surrounding areas and then kind of catering that, that area. That's kind of where you're going to really kill it. Mm, exactly. They got the same pictures, standard level of pictures too. That helps. Why the customer base? People just want to eat stuff. They're willing to try things out more. I've, I, I try things out more via delivery app, and I would do maybe in real life too. I'm not sure if you guys are the same, but I know I do. And I never get that kind of famine thinking. It's I guess it's a journalist that asks those kind of you know stupid questions, but. I never get the idea, oh, this is going to be a threat to the movie, the cinema industry, to this industry. It's like, there's no such thing as threats. Like, things change, right? I listened to a really good podcast today um, by uh, Seth Godin, my, uh, one, of my, my, one of my mentors from afar. Um, and he released a podcast today called Supple, right? And he's speaking about um, how things are always changing and how in most industries, the people that who are more willing to change with the industry as it's moving along, as opposed to being resistant, are the ones that are being more successful, which is kind of, you know, an obvious thing to say. But it seems like in every era, in every industry, wherever, wherever, wherever you look at the course of time, there's a section of people that kind of resist the change that's incoming and they always get caught flat-footed and they're always the ones that are most surprised by the change. Uh, but I think what you can... What you, what the one thing you can guarantee that you can say for certain is that even over a period of 10, 20, 30 years, this dark kitchen um, model will evolve into something else anyway. And this will become redundant. It's just the nature of the beast. But if you're arguing that dark kitchens are going to replace kit restaurants, that's ridiculous. Like no one is not going to restaurants anymore because they use Uber Eats. Restaurant experience still exists, same way cinema experience still exists. But you've got Netflix, you've got YouTube Films, you've got Hulu, you've got Amazon Video. These things still exist because people don't mind going to a, a a cinema and watching a movie and paying uh, paying a little bit of a premium to see a film and you know go somewhere out with a friend or hang out or whatever that experience is still going to exist in the same way people still go club and even though you can watch you know boiler room sets of your favorite dj from the comfort of your own duvet um these experiences are always going to happen but again it's the it's the it's the kind of um nature of the beast that things will evolve over time with convenience people with, with the more with the drive for convenience things like dark engines will be ever more ever ever more present but again it's not these things are also limited by the area you're in, right? Because sometimes the best restaurants that you want to go and eat from might not be in your area because your area might not necessarily have the cachet or might not necessarily cater towards that kind of food, right? So it's not necessarily the restaurant's experience is going to die because you have to live in an area that has good restaurants around you for it to even have that kind of thing in your head. Again, I just think change is, change is, change is inevitable. Uh, don't fight it. Don't fight it. Yeah looking to replace that it's still a small part of our business but, but certainly it's it's something that seems to be working really well for everyone so why not continue to expand and the amount of jobs is given everyone from the delivery drivers from the kitchen from the people that work in the kitchen um to every for the people that handle the actual app itself there might be somebody working um with the company um that just handles the app the app orders that are coming in managing that kind of thing the experience that you'll get it's really un unheard of man it's really really unheard of it's a quality 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 thing delivery labels meals to show they don't come from a restaurant editions but as more of us turn to apps when we're hungry well will we care of course not i oh, think okay so editions is what they do in-house okay i didn't know that actually it's good to know but yeah, that's cool to see, man. A great, great, amazing um, investment. I think Travis is killing it. No surprise that the former founder of Uber has invested in these dark kitchens. I think we're going to see a lot of them popping up across the country. Next on the list here, what else do we have? I want to speak about... Da, 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 da. Woodstock 50th anniversary has been cancelled. Woodstock 50th anniversary has been cancelled. For those of you that were eagerly anticipating to go, unfortunately, it's over. So um, this is an, uh, a, a, a bit of news I saw over the week, and I'm sure it had it had something to do with Fire Festival. I'm pretty sure, um, as we'll find out as we read it. So, what's the 50th anniversary show that may be cancelled? The show was originally scheduled for August. Uh, following a lackluster lineup announcement announcing a special anniversary show with Jay-Z, Chance Rapper, The Killers, My Cyrus, Woodstock has reportedly cancelled the, the intended 16th to 18th show. Did they say lackluster? Why did it say it was lackluster? Did people did did you think it was lackluster? I thought it was right in line with what people what people would want nowadays from that kind of festival, no? 
what, why did they say it was lackluster? Hmm. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, let's continue reading the article. According to a statement issued by Billboard, organizers of the show said, it's a dream for agencies to work with iconic brands and to be associated with meaningful movements. We have a strong history of producing experiences that bring people together around common interests and causes, which is why we chose to be part of Woodstock 50th anniversary. But despite our tremendous investment of time, effort, and commitment, we don't believe the production of the festival can be executed as an, even, as an event worthy of the Woodstock brand name while also ensuring the health and safety of the artists, partners, and attendees. As a result, and after careful consideration, Detsu, I guess, Networks, Amplify Live, a partner with Woodstock 50, has decided to cancel the festival. As difficult as it is, we believe that it's the most prudent decision for all parties involved. Shit. So again, I think uh, in the era of, in the era of um, cancelled documentaries, in the era, in the era of post-fire um, festival, and all that kind of malarkey and you know maybe it's a, maybe it's the fourth TanaCon, you know maybe Tana montague was to blame for all this shit right like we saw just how much work goes into organizing a convention a festival and we saw how quickly it can deteriorate we saw how inept some people can be in terms of what they're organizing that now we kind of really give a lot of value a lot of credence to people that can put on a semi-decent event without any hiccups it's really hard to do i know i know for me especially being a fan of electronic music in i think the first couple of electronic festivals that happened in london when you know i think let's say crank brothers are the first even the Stratford, even their shortage thing was quite well done but i think just um there was a period just after the the what is it called not is it pickle factory i think just after the pickle factory or i forgot what car park goes in shoreditch wherever it used to use to go warehouse parties anyway there was, there was a period just after that kind of era ended that a lot of promoters started putting on their own events in different venues right kind of like quote unquote same one day festivals and we got to see just how difficult it was to do those kind of things because there were so many hiccups. I remember the resident advisor comments being flooded with negative reviews about the sound system being shared, the toilets not working well, the bar not being fully stocked, not being well staffed, like just loads of really bad hiccups. And another time, as you know, these guys got more and more um, experience and got more used to putting on those kind of shows, they got a lot better and the production value and the production quality went up a little bit more. And so far, for the most part, it's unlikely you're going to get the festival that's going to, you know, there's going to be major hiccups apart from what was that festival in South London London where they had massive queues and people were waiting up for ages but for the most part shows do go on they don't usually get cancelled because of lack of production um because the production um standards aren't where they need to be so for Woodstock to cancel this it does show that you know at there was a fear amongst the group that that were organizing it that it was going to descend into 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 shit and if they're mentioning the lineup was lackluster maybe the response on social media might play in some part into it right because i know for sure i wouldn't go to woodstock to go see miley cyrus perform like fuck that um maybe jay-z the killers for sure other people in the lineup would be awesome um maybe they couldn't really guarantee to get most of the people they wanted to on the lineup because it probably was organized quite last minute. I'd assume some of the big acts, they probably went to perform there. Um, some of the legacy acts, you know, they probably are booked out, you know, four or five years in advance. So to get them down would have been something hard. It being the 50th anniversary, you don't want to muddy the, the name, muddy the legacy of the brand by putting on like last event. And I also think sometimes as well, and now this is some, my only thinking because I'm not that bothered about birthdays. I think you don't always need to do your anniversary event on the anniversary date. I don't actually believe that. I think sometimes if you want to really ensure the quality of the show you can do it whenever you want later on down the line and just put it on and make everyone aware that hey we're celebrating 50th anniversary not the 50th anniversary right now but it's a 50th anniversary celebration um that can happen any time in the year and i think just a bit more notice a bit more care in the lineup maybe a bit more of an eclectic lineup too that kind of really speaks to the current zygots what's going on in the industry now you know chance rapper and jay-z is one aspect of it but you could always go a bit further by inviting other guests in who are smashing it in their own perspective arena to really showcase their best at the what woodstock um so it says here, in the end, though the final decision seems clear, Wilson 50 has also issued a conflicting statement um, claiming that the cancellation news is false. Wilson 50 is vehemently denying the festival's cancellation and legal remedy is sought. Of course it's going to be cancelled. It's, it's going to be in August. I've not seen anything else revealed about it. We've not really heard anything else about the production, how they're planning it, what's in store. The lineup, if that's the full lineup, that sounds fucking shit to go to Woodstock 50th anniversary. It's got Jay-Z, Chance Rapper, and The Killers, and that's it. Like, you need more than that to really make it worthwhile. Oh, actually, there was the entire lineup here, right? That's the next screen. What's the entire lineup? <laughs> so, the entire lineup was three days of love, peace, and, and music. It says The Killers, Miley Cyrus, Santana, The Luminaries, The Raconteurs, Robert Plant, 
uh, Nathaniel Ratcliffe, Joseph Fogarty, Ronda Jules, Head and Hart, Maggie Rogers, Bishop Briggs, Anderson East, Akon, Princess Not <coughs> Akon. It's a weird booking, isn't it? Grandson, Princess Nokia and Akon next to together is a fucking odd that one, isn't it, right? Day two, they got Dead and Company, Chance Rapper, Black Keys, Sergio Simpson, Greta Van Fleet, Portugal the Man, one of my favourite brands, Leon Bridges, one of my favourite R B R is Gary Clark Jr. Woo! That second day is already much better. Edward uh, Sharp and the Magic uh, Magnetic Zeros, David Crosby and Friends, Doors, Margot Price, Narco Medicine for the People, Indy Ari, Wow, Jade Bird, Country Joe McClure, Rival Sons, awesome, awesome band. One of my one of my one of my um, greatest um, discoveries, I think, in the last few years, um, listen to Rival Sons. Listen to that first album. Whew, so good. So fucking good, Rival Sons. I don't know how I figured them out. Did I find them through... I might have found Rival Sons because of Sons of Anarchy. You know? I think so. It might have been because of them. Um, but yeah, check those out. Emily King, Soccer Mummy. Again, a nice, great band too. Sir, Taylor Bennett. Loads of R&B here, innit? More, probably more R&B than hip-hop. IMDDB. Wow. She would have performed at Woodstock. Wow. Credit to her, man. Um, fellow um, Angolan, UK artist, Jay-Z, Imagine Dragons, Halsey, Cage the Elephant, Brandy Kerr, Janelle Monet, Young Giant, Courtney Barnett, Common, Vince Staples, L Sweatshirt, Boy Genius, Rain Wolf, Zombies, Can Me, Hot Tuna, Pussy Riot, Cherry Glazer. <sighs> good lineup, man. It's a very, very good lineup. I'm not going to lie. It's a really good lineup. I don't know if... Uh, it's probably a few people I'd probably slip off the list here and there, but I think by and large, a very, very good lineup. Um, Again, so Saturday is going to be um, cancelled. It's going to be meant to be at Watkins Coast in New York, August 16th, 17th, 18th. And, you know, already... Festival is now already, like, well, full into promo mode. So if they're not talking about anything now online, then I don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, what's up, 50th anniversary? Cancelled! What's on the list here? What's next here on the list? Uh, da, 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 da. Glaston, the common lineup and more more lineup news uh, here for you guys. Glaston reveals lineup for the dance music leaning area, the common. Man, I'm kind of annoyed that I haven't been able to go to Glastonbury. I know for sure Glastonbury is that basic bit central. You know, it's where people go and eat fucking vanilla ice cream and uh, pretend they're taking psychedelics and shit. I know that, but I really want to go for myself and see what it's like. I know a lot of people have a bad reputation about it and they get a bit annoyed because it's incredibly white. But I really want to go. Um, I really want to go and see what it's all about um, and see what the deal is by and large. Um, yeah, so Glastonbury is on this year and it line up for their electronic music festival like electronic music festival stage the common has been finalized one second da, da, da. so where's this custom revealed reveal the lineup for its electronic music festival arena the common established names such as uh fabio and group fabio and group wider jamie joseph Chopsa, rob shoulders two stages return let me see what the common is right the common what a great little lineup, man. Glastonbury's going to be awesome this year. It's, it's come back from one year high hiatus. You know they're going to go fucking hard, isn't it? Stormzy's meant to be headlining too, isn't it? Which is interesting booking. Um, not the biggest Stormzy fan, but I think, you know, it should be interesting what he's going, what he will have in mind because I'm sure he knows that there's doubters out there so he's going to try and bring his A game. Anyway, so the comment at Glastonbury, this is the entire lineup at the moment. Looks in, looks interesting here who they've got here it's all in alphabetical order too which is nice thank you guys for doing that come on move along okay cool so what do they have here they have 24 hour garage girls who don't know here too um what do they have bird barely legal i know her they have channel one sound system they have gasper Nelly. they have grace they have jamie jones what else they have here? Natty Speaks, Seth Troxler. Okay, not really a lot of people that I know here actually on this list, actually, to be completely honest. All right, fair enough. Well, that's the common. We'll skip that for now. I didn't, honestly, I didn't, I, there's not a lot of people there that actually know who, who they are. I guess for the most part, you're not really going to Glastonbury to go and see DJs play, are you? You're going to go and discover new bands, new live acts and shit. Probably not the best place to go and see a DJ. But again, it's a nice little add-on to your overall experience. I'd imagine so. Um, next on the list, what else do we have here? Let's squeeze in a couple more before we end. 
uh, uh, ban phones from the dance floor i agree i've spoken about it ad nauseum on this fucking podcast haven't i but we're going to speak about it even more now um this is an article from the dj mag uh, website that i follow quite closely i recommend you check it out for your electronic music news um the title of the article is is it time for a total ban on phones on the dance floor which i thoroughly agree with that image when you're at gig and you're seeing those kind of lights beaming back at you is super annoying um so um it's commonly understood this article continues i'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out too so you guys listen to it just read it yourself it's commonly understood that phone use at live events is a big problem high profile djs have been talking about the issue since at least 2015 at both animac and warehouse project founder uh, but, and both Animac and Warehouse Project founder Sasha Lord publicly railed against overfilming early this year, saying in essence that it kills a vibe. A host of think pieces and opinion columns um, have also been published on the subject, with some suggesting the mass implementation of Bergan's infamous no photo policy as a way to protect the, the night. But for the first time, we now have a hard data showing exactly what the British go- gig going public thinks about using phones to film and photograph, photograph live events. The data comes from a survey conducted by a global thinking company, ticketing company event bright over a 12 month period 1000 and 1000 and 1031 british adults were surveyed and all that attended a live ticket event within the year and while the data shows just how unpopular camera phones usage is in events also wielded some surprising contradictory results first Let's look at how popular um, unpopular filming is. The wide majority of those surveys, seventy percent, said that they find it irritating when others take pictures or videos during a show. Totally agreed. It's incredibly irritating and annoying because usually the people that are taking videos and and or pictures are usually in the best places to take videos and pictures, which is usually the best place to dance, right? The place where you want to go and let yourself go, put your hair down, dance, flow your arms around. That's why somebody's always got a phone out, take a picture of their friend or doing whatever nonsense they're doing. So it's always kind of, and it kind of forces everyone else to kind of move differently around the space. It's something as well you don't really take, you don't really, you take for granted when you go to Berlin, the freedom of movement. Everyone moves wherever they want. You can walk right across in the front, you can walk right in front of the DJ booth without any trouble because no one's just standing there recording the DJ in front of the railings. You can walk all the way around where people are dancing and stuff. There's no real, there's no real bump. You're not really afraid of bumping into somebody because the only thing they have in their hand is a drink. And they're usually a little bit, you know, they usually know how to hold it in the right way so it doesn't, you know, slip out of their hands. But when somebody's got a drink and a phone in their hand, you feel super conscious about making sure you don't bump into them so they don't drop their expensive smartphone and you sort of bump into them so you don't drop their their drink. It's a lot of it's a lot of hassle. It really affects how you move around the space. So I definitely agree with that. Um, the second thing, and even the majority, 81%, said that they, under, they understood why an artist might not like videoing and photogra- photographing an event. And as many artists have stated, they usually don't. Do I find myself having to forest or uh, to playing to a forest of phones waving in the air? Or stall German DJ Anja Schneider, of course. And for me, that's a problem because you can't see the people, you can't see the vibe, you can't see people's faces, which is true. I can only imagine what it must look like from the DJ booth because you know the places I play at for the mostly are in bars and pubs. I'm not really playing in super dark lit. Um, nightclubs but i can only imagine that already at a nightclub you don't really get to see anybody on the dance floor because it's super dark but imagine all you're seeing is just these fucking you know the edges of these screens beaming back at you as they're dancing but they're not really dancing just standing you don't you can't really get away and again you only get a vibe of the place when you're in a club for the most part for me when i'm standing at the back i get to see what the vibe is usually when i come into a nightclub i'll usually might grab a drink go to the toilet or go to the toilet, grab a drink, come back on the dance floor and kind of survey the room. I'll probably go from the back of the room all the way to the, from one side of the room at the back to the other side and might go, and if there's any space towards the edges, I'll kind of quickly stand in the front and see what the vibe is and then kind of, you know, pitch out around the back and find a little spot that I can dance and have a good time in. And usually that's where you get the vibe. But I guess if you're a DJ and you're all the way at the front, you can't tell that I'm having the time of my life at the back here. You just see those dullards at the front chin stroking and you know trying to clock what tune you're playing or recording a thing so they can put an opportunity later it's just a bit annoying you'd actually want it reversed you'd want me my group of people who are having the best fun to, or having the time of their lives to be at the front and for those chin strokers to be at the back but that's not how it works out unfortunately um, a majority of people also said that they feel like they're they'd be missing out on the event itself while taking pictures and video which is also true taking photos and videos is large, it's hugely distracting and doing it well is hard work just ask any f- f- club photographer. Of course, how many times have you been on Facebook and seen a club promoter asking for a club photographer, a good one, to come take pictures? It's very hard to take pictures in a place that is really not uh, made for you to take pictures in. Sometimes in, in places, some of the best events you go to want, want you to take pictures because people are having a good time. They don't want a record of it to live on the internet. Um, 
And there's also the idea that, you know, with your smartphone and your shitty smartphone and it's kind of rudimentary built in flash, you're never going to get, you're never going to capture the moment of why you were in there in this full glory anyway. So why bother? Um, especially if you go, and you know what I don't understand the most, the one that really gets on my butt, be, like be in my bonnet, is the fucking people that record at a boiler room. That is when it's, that's when I really want to pull my hair out. You're in a boiler room, right? Boiler room nowadays, if you've been to a boiler room in the past, I have been when it first kind of started. They were essentially just having, you know, the camera set up in front of the DJ as they were DJing. And maybe they might have had another camera that was pointing out to the crowd. But for the most part, it was mostly focused on the DJ. People stood around and that was it, right? Nowadays, that boiler room, if you go, it's a full, it's a full production, mate, right? They have cameras. They have three or four cameras um, um, pointing at the DJ. They have a person or a, a guy or a girl with an entire rig. You know those rigs that you can use as you're walking around, film people inside the actual arena. It's like so on the fucking dance floor, moving around from side to side. They have another person sometimes with a, a little handy um, GoPro, handy camera in their hand, they're recording some raw footage too. There's always cameras around. People are still recording at a boiler room. It doesn't make any sense. The only time you don't see it happening is at the Berlin boiler room. And guess what? Guess what? Which ones are the best boiler rooms um, when you watch them online uh, for the most part? The Berlin boiler rooms. They're the ones where people are actually having the most fun. They're dancing. They wear the most outlandish outfits. And there's not a phone in sight because in, they're, they're trained, right? That's the, that's your day-to-day -day life. Like, you don't get the chance to, like, have your phone and record shit. You can use your phone if you want to. But for the most part, even that's kind of frowned upon. Enjoy yourself. Um, put your phone away for fucking six hours and just enjoy the music. Anyway, Dr. Linda um, Hinkle of Farfield University of Connecticut explains you're actually less likely to remember whatever it is your mind's taking photos of because of what she calls photo taking impatient photo taking impainment effect. Your brain simply checks out the checks out of remembering the moment because it's already addicted to the responsibility of your smartphone. Very, very true. Um, again, I don't know anyone that rewatches their stuff. Who rewatches their videos that they record at gigs really? Do you rewatch them? Do you upload them? Do you upload them to YouTube? What do you do with those videos? Like, I don't understand the need for it. It's different when you're vlogging and you're, you know, a vlogger and you want to document your lifestyle or what you're doing or your days or documenting stuff. Cool. But recording an event, I've never rewatched a video that I've recorded in an event and see, oh man, I remember that. I don't, I don't even remember what happened. And I guess that kind of goes back to what she's saying here. Um, it continues, uh, more so humans aren't meant to experience life behind the screen, especially at a communal event like a festival. Life where sharing a physical experience that can easily be replicated in a digital realm is being is a big part of what makes it so special. Of course, right? That's why I love nightlife. That's why I love club culture. That's why I'll fight until, you know, until the cows come home, until the very end. Uh, against these draconian um, London licensing laws and do, to ensure that we have a very diverse and rich um, plane of um, or arena or options of clubbing experiences because for the most part they've really benefited me in the long run I've really been it's really affected who I am as a person it's allowed me to grow it's made me to uh, tap into a new scene to make friends to discover interests I never knew I had to do a hobby now DJing in bars and pubs where I get fucking paid to play in these random bubs and pubs it, it, you know, as a hobby it's amazing it's something that's really really expanded my world view I travel to different places I go different zones I'm more comfortable in different random areas because of the places I go in clubbing wise it's really benefited me so much so but I don't think I could have had those benefits if I was just standing there with a fucking phone in front of my face making sure I'm capturing every single event it wouldn't happen that way um anyway it continues um each designated person or group uh, becomes a black hole of social engine energy as author david kane notes pulling attention away from what's actually happening so if all which is very very true so if all this is true if we know filming both as djs takes out a live experience and irritates almost everyone around us why do we keep doing it well because we're selfish people are saying it's okay if i use my phone at an event because i want to get the special photo but when someone else does it well that's really annoying which is very true i don't tend to do it at all the last thing i did take a picture out was the drake tour and again i took like a one a two second video that was incredibly horrible if you're on my instagram you'll check it out or if i've seen it in my stories i did it before it's just really shitty video and i felt really shitty about doing it but i don't necessarily take videos anywhere dr harlinger statement likely won't surprise anyone who noticed um had heading to a story statement would know anyone noticed the narcissistic nature of many live events mm -hmm. festivals clubs and concerts are places where having the perfect night can sometimes come at a cost for everyone else but having that perfect night suddenly becomes much more difficult if the stage is hidden behind a sea of phones or if a nearby group won't stop taking selfies or using their phone flashes yeah i don't really mind people taking videos but it's just the fact that they don't stop 
it's just like a they don't there's no end it's oh another one another one because there's always something going on right the vj puts on good lighting the dj maybe cuts out the bass brings it back in again uses an effect people's hands are going there's always something happening so it's like oh, they're always kind of chasing that moment it's like no just capture what you want to capture and put your phone away but people don't do that this is why outright bands probably work out the best despite how annoying camera phones at live events have become usage um, isn't likely to stop on its own on its own anytime soon after all one third of the survey also said filming and video and video photographing was an important part of a live experience and nearly half said that they took photos and videos at events they attended again i don't know why you do that it's just about it's, it's not just the young people either 34 to 44 year old crowd are probably the worst actually i just like it to do it as 18 to 24 that means it's going to have to come down to venues and to a less extent artists do something despite common understanding that cracking down would alienate fans the survey shows that majority of people Six nine percent feel strongly about uh, supporting measures that might limit mobile phone use at live events, which is true. You'd think it would happen, right? But it might look at a place like Bergheim, right? They're incredibly harsh on the door. There's an incredibly high um, threshold in order to enter, right? You have to meet a certain criteria to enter in the first place. They don't like you to take pictures. And they continually turn people away, right? So they do all the things that would necessarily wouldn't necessarily cultivate a good experience. They do away with those conventions and they enforce these rules and people still line up every single weekend to go and party that place without fail. So they've basically ensured, they basically showcased to us why it works. Because what happens is that once you finally get into that place after loads of failed attempts, what you realize is that, oh, this is why they, they this is why there's such there's such dicks downstairs because of this. You're like, ah, now it, it makes complete sense. Now it makes all the sense in the world. So I think um those efforts are made by the venues, what kind of translates into the actual club itself. And there's plenty of times we've been in the club and I've actually seen people that are in the club having a good time tell somebody off for using their phone. Sometimes someone might take the sticker off and take a picture and someone will tell them off, like, no, don't do that. We don't do that here. And that's the community police themselves because the rules have been enforced so well in the front of the house that it's really, um, it plays into the level of comfortability they have in the venue that anytime they see someone breaking the rules or going, you know, veering off course, like, hey, hey don't do that because you're going to fuck up this for everybody. Yeah, right? That one selfish action you're doing for yourself is going to impact us all. Don't do that. Which is why on YouTube, you probably can find maybe four or five videos at the at most of what's in, it's inside. Of, what, what's what's it like being inside Burger? And even then, it's not really a very fair reflection of what's inside or what's it like to be in there. It also shows that there is a support to measures like creating no phone zones. And I don't agree that no phone zones. Just don't put them in there at all. Spot checks or over filming or, over, or, more, or more popularity, gentle nudges by venue staff to make phones more discreet. Artists can also get more vocal or social media reminding fans to film early before enjoying the rest of the night, which I definitely agree with. That's what Charlie Scambino did and he set during Coachella and it worked a treat. If you watch his set, there's not that many phones out there for the most part. I'm not sure what happened in the second week, but I remember the first week he told everyone not to film and just to enjoy the night. That was really good. As for industry professionals, approximately four out of five surveyed had concerns about people recording or pictures during performances. However, this point, 63% had no measure issue with it. Whether it's more no photo policies at clubs like Beyond Berlin, signs posted outside down or asking patrons to keep their phones pocketed security offering gentle reminders um to stop patrons from over filming or alternatives like yonder the support is there what happens next is up to us the yonder thing i don't think will work i think in general people will tend to go out i think if you don't know yonder yonder is a service that dave Chappelle made popular it's these little pouches that comedians sometimes use where in a venue they'll have these little pouches that attendees can put their phones in it has a lock that only they can open and then they leave their phone they, they leave the phone in person if they want to use it, they have to unlock the pouch by going outside and scanning it on like a little it's like a little you know those shop things they use in the shop to kind of take off the tag you scan it on there and it opens your phone so you can only use your phone when you go out of the venue so what it does it limits you getting up and down because you know you have to kind of use you know it's like a it's like the toilet in the cinema right it's so far away so you have to limit the times the amount of times you get up you have to make sure you get your piss in before the movie starts you don't keep up get up and start disturbing everyone's night same with the comedy clubs i don't think i'll work in a nightclub it'll be hordes of people outside and it'll be it'll be bad for the dj too because there'll be waves of people going in and out of the night and it wouldn't be a fair question of, of 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 what how much fun people have it would just be it would just be an effect of their anxiety of their phones so i think in general a far out ban is the best thing to do and you know again enjoy the night man no need to have phones on the dance floor at all uh talking about fo phones on the dance floor there's this great little video from this nightclub that i went to that i think is maybe the best nightclub in london at the moment for me precisely even though i had a couple 
um, dicey experiences with them recently but I still maintain it's one of the best ones it's in my former home in Canning Town and it's a club none other than Fold Fold have put together an amazing little promo video showcasing what it's like being inside Fold I told you before previously in another video that I went to Fold in opening night maybe one of the best London parties I've been to in a while it really gave me uh, flashbacks of the best parts of, of the best things I've found in clubs in Berlin and Frankfurt and it was kind of unlucky but done in a really authentic London way it's kind of evolved it's got a a bit more popular they're really doing well now more nights are starting up they're doing their fold present series that i think is kicking off this weekend as well and just really going forward and really pushing um the really pushing the the sound the scene forward with what they're doing it's a really um advantageous place for us londoners because it's the only 24-hour license nightclub that we have in london they don't have a license all the time i'm pretty sure but for sometimes in a month they have the ability to basically put on a party from friday evening until sunday morning which is an incredible thing for londoners who like to party and like to have a good time um it's based in canning town which is right around the corner from the jubilee line another 24-hour uh rail line that you can go back to very easily and just in general just run by really sound people that really get it if anything there might be a little bit too much security in there for my liking but again it's a london venue you can't really um begrudge them for that but they put together a really amazing video that really showcases what it's like being inside a fold and i really want you to check it out here um let me get up here on the screen for you guys to see make this thing a bit bigger so it was on Facebook, I saw it earlier. Again, I'm not too sure how I feel about them filming a video inside because I think it might invite people to start taking pictures, but I know on the outside, they do make sure they make sure people don't take pictures inside the club, right? I'm pretty sure they give you stickers. I know when I went the first time, they gave us stickers to cover on our phone. I'm not sure they do, so still can just do that, but I'll show you the video anyway regardless so you guys can check it out for yourself. Let's get it up on here. It's on Facebook, boom. <laughs> It's really well made video. I hope you don't have it up on their Facebook as well. I'm on their YouTube channel later. It's only a minute long as well. Hold on. Where's the sound not playing? Can you hear that? There you go. Put the sound back up again. Just rewind that a bit. Boom. Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah. Woo. So good, man. What a space. Amazing space, man, to go and party at, no? Look at that. Wow. Literally one of the best clubs in London. Such a treat to be into. The shutters as well on the side. Look at that. So good. Amazing, 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 amazing. So big up Fold, doing the good, doing God's work there. An amazing little venue, uh, based out of South London, a bit based in East London, in the depths of East London, the real parts of East London. Again, I'm not too sure how comfortable I am with the video. I think in, in I think maybe because it's not been maybe because they had a bit of trouble getting people through the door the last couple of months. I'm not too sure if that was true, but I kind of from the outside looking in, it kind of looked like that. Um, it looked like they were overly relying on bookings and stuff and getting big DJ acts in, which probably isn't a way to go for that sort of a venue. But I guess London, you just have to kind of do that dance. You can't really operate like a Grease Mule or like a Bergano or Panama Bar and just have like no lineups. And it makes people come in. I don't sure, I'm not sure it, it sells off that way, but I'm hoping over time with their full present series, they're able to put on more nights that are basically, you know, things that they put on themselves at all in-house, because at the moment, you know, look through their list of um, nights they put on at the, at, the, at the event, and it's loads of kind of random flyers from loads of different promoters, which, you know, is good for them sometimes, but I like to sometimes have a kind of a unifying sound, a unifying theme going through. I kind of think of Robert Johnson. There's a good kind of um, uh, inkling with that. You know, they put on nights, they organize kind of theme nights that are kind of tied in a particular kind of music style, a particular kind of genre, a particular kind of taste, and then they have DJs kind of fill up the lineup and kind of play along those kind of lines but sometimes with um i feel like with fold it sometimes feels like a haberdashery like just a play like a venue you can just put on a party in whatever it may be but i think in the beginning it was sold as they were going to be putting on a few more in-house events but maybe because of that they've kind of had to kind of dance with the whole you know social media thing it was a bit of a social media dark blackout in terms of what you were able to post about them online they weren't necessarily allowed pictures and now they're kind of inviting videographers to make pitch videos uh based on the club and again i, I think I think it's probably fair. It's probably a good thing to do nowadays. I think I'm probably being unnecessarily harsh. I think if Panorama Bar Berghain launched now, 
they would have to maybe put some kind of video promotion thing out there, right? I think the fact that it's got so much legacy, they're able to kind of, you know, um, operate off the back of their legacy now and not necessarily need to get too deep into social media. Same with Supreme, right? Supreme have an Instagram, but they basically use it the same way they use their news archive on their website. They use just to post news. They don't really, you know, go out of their way to kind of do live videos or to do Instagram stories or to really use the app in its kind of native sense. They just use it as another form to another platform to kind of get their message out. But I think if Supreme launched nowadays, they would have to do some of the things that people do nowadays to garner the attention or to get the eyes on them and then kind of back away when need be. Or maybe not, I don't know. But um I guess that's the way to be fair. Um Ford have got loads of events on to this weekend as well. I think they've got that at Ford Presents events on I think it was this weekend. Yeah, it is, right? So they've got two big parties on that I think a lot of people are really hyped about. One that's been featured by RA is an RA pick. Uh, for this weekend which is always a good little thing for a promoter i guess um they've got a, a, a night on here jet series and aria presents uh pa parasila live i think i saw them before didn't i where did i see them before was it here was it for the door somewhere else i'm sure um and then they've got four presents um here too on the saturday on the fourth feeding off namen and we the uh wider garba wider garba right wider garba and offline so yeah so both events i recommend you check out again tickets are usually quite fairly priced for the most part usually about 12 to 15 pounds yep here so they've got 20 four foolish tickets 20 pounds left for the party on friday and then they've got 12 pound tickets with one pound 50 booking fee for the night on saturday recommend you check it out again that's a really good flyer actually i'd wear that on a t-shirt that was awesome kodak empire philip strobel sarin and melania playing there and then for the party on friday uh they have parcella live blowing and analog cops which would be fucking awesome they have directs uh ceases and enemy dltn and burden so i recommend you check that out really really good party series and one of my favorite clubs in london anyway that's a minute 20 um thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have the company of you on this particular podcast today i will see you because i'll be seeing you guys again tomorrow from another episode of the show uh but until then take a look at my website for more information regarding myself i'm going to be playing at the heathcote star on the 25th of may that's a saturday so check that out um link will be available on the show notes um for you guys watching on youtube uh please click subscribe and like and leave a comment let me know what you think of the show but if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five-star review let your mates know what i'm talking about I'm talking about that good info and that you know what i mean and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show take care and peace.